Um, I'm Brandon Gallis. I'm at the FDA Center for Devices and Radiologic Radiological Health. I'm in the research arm of the center, the Office of Science and Engineering Laboratories. Specifically, I'm in the Division of Imaging, Diagnostics, and Software Reliability. So we do research about imaging devices and these algorithms that are adjuncts to these devices. And then we provide um, review support to the submissions that come into the agency. Um, also representing uh, the High Throughput Truthing Project, uh, which is a collaborative project to produce pathologist annotations to evaluate viewers and algorithms. And I hope that's what you were expecting today, because that's what we're talking about, and specifically the data collection for the upcoming um, data collection event right in front of the USCAP meeting. So the outline of our um, webinar is going to start off with me talking about the HTT project. And then we're going to move on to Roberto Salgado, who is the one of the chairs of the International Immuno-Oncology Working Group. And he's going to talk about the clinical task of evaluating tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Then we'll work down to the actual instructions for data collection, which we will launch on February 28th. And that'll be Sarah Dudgeon, who also is in the Division of Imaging, Diagnostics, and Software Reliability with me. And we should have time for some questions at the end. Boom, close that there. Uh, I'll let you know that we do have a wiki page, Sarah will show you it later, that has all the materials about the data collection event and all the slides that you'll see today. I want to first start out by thanking and uh, acknowledging a lot of my collaborators on the HTT project. Uh, this is just one page of them. Um, here we're showing the, uh, the platform teams, the digital platform teams for CA Microscope and Path Presenter. Some of the clinical and slide jet sourcing support people and uh, some statisticians in our team. And then uh, the committee that we communicate with for feedback and to supporting on data collection and uh, the specifics for, every, for our project. I'm going to talk about what we're doing, why we're going to collect this data, when we're going to collect this data, and how you can stay up to date. So what we're doing is hopefully encapsulated in the title for the project, High Throughput Truthing of Microscope Slides to Evaluate Artificial Intelligence Algorithms. These algorithms are going to analyze digital scans of pathology slides. We're going to create data, and by data I mean the slides themselves, the images of those slides, and then annotations from pathologists. And we will pursue an FDA-qualified medical device development tool. And I'll talk about all of this in a little bit more detail, but hopefully a higher review that won't take too long. So the clinical task uh, is represented a little bit here and is outlined in a tutorial produced by the International Immuno-Oncology Working Group and specifically the tutorial related to TILS and breast cancer. And that's what Roberto Salgado will be discussing next. In that tutorial, uh, they ask pathologists to report the percentage of tumor-associated stromal lymphocytes. Specifically, think of the fraction where the area of tumoral, tumoral stroma is in the denominator and the area of the lymphocytes is in the numerator. And uh, because we can't see them at this magnification, you have to zoom in. Um, we're going to be talking about specific regions of interest. And the tutorial asks that pathologists report the average of the stromal area and not to focus on hot spots. Here's a zoom in. Can we get muted uh, on the microphone or on the phones? Um, Here's a zoom in of one of those areas showing the cells, the tumor clusters, the stroma, and the lymphocytes. And in a microscope, they call this zooming in the field of view, or a high-powered field of view. In digital mode, we can mark out specific regions of interest. 
And in digital mode, in the digital images, the evaluation can be done by a pathologist or an algorithm. And we are going to ask for the evaluations by both the pathologist and ultimately the algorithm. So why are we collecting this data? We'll have more information on the data collection a little bit. But why we're collecting this data is because we want to collaborate with the community and build consensus methods and tools and disseminate thoughts and procedures for doing data collection that could support algorithms. Uh, whether it's protocols and annotation formats that can be used across platforms, whether it's from annotations from humans or algorithms, and then also to do research on what statistical methods and even create software so that we can all be evaluating the same things. And it will be transparent what's being evaluated. And it will ease everybody's uh, uh, pathway into doing those analyses. You know, ultimately, the goal is to improve submissions. And a byproduct of that, hopefully, is to support and enable interoperability across systems. A little bit more on why we're collecting this data is because we don't like to be an isolated organization here at the FDA. We want to involve all the stakeholders, not just industry even. We want to involve the pathologists and academics and health providers because this technology will impact them. We want to include the associations and societies and colleges because they have access to uh, the pathologists and the, really the knowledge base in pathology. We think that um, by involving everybody, we'll actually increase the impact of our work um, by giving pathologists a voice on the evaluation, um, that will give them confidence to use the algorithms. And uh, really, having a pathologist involved in the evaluation of algorithms, you know, gives that perspective to the whole effort. And ultimately, we're hoping to create examples for stakeholders to follow so that other groups can create data sets, including industry. And then, bottom line, is we hope to improve public health. So we're collecting data in just a week and a few days on Friday, February 28th. This uh, webinar is in some sense to support that effort. We are planning to include board certified anatomic pathologists in our data collection and residents. We will be taking equipment to this event in Los Angeles, specifically two microscope systems and two digital platforms. So we will have four workstations in operation. We have a study set of 64 slides split into eight batches of eight slides. Uh, and there's going to be 10 ROIs pre-identified on each slide. We hope that this, um, these batches can be accomplished in 30 minutes each. Because the whole point is to be quick and dirty and get people in and out quickly without taking up too much time. After this event, we are looking for sites near DC that we can put our equipment in the van and do a road trip to collect data. We're looking for locations that have, you know, a significant number of pathologists willing to participate. Please let us know if you're interested in hosting a data collection event, such as one we will be hosting at USCAP. So I want to let you know how to keep uh, up to date. We have uh, uh, a w these are collaborative spaces on NCI Hub. Here I'm showing the front page part of it for the project, the High Throughput Truthing Project. Year two, we're actually in year three, and year three includes um, all the data collection materials you'll be seeing today, and the video or uh, the webinar recording as well. This, um, this web page is part of a larger wiki that has other information. Some of it might be a little old, or, but at least it's a record of the research we've been doing. And specifically, I want to point out some work we are, or a page that uh, I created to support people interested in understanding the evaluation of algorithms in the regulatory context. 
this device advice page, which has pointers to lots of guidance documents um, published by the FDA and some example devices that have been approved. Most of these devices are in radiology, as radiology has been digital a little bit longer than pathology. I want to also point out uh, a collaborative alliance that has been taking shape for about seven months now. The objectives of this alliance are to clarify and improve regulatory pathways. This is a great thing for me to think that I've got external collaborators that want to clarify and improve regulatory pathways or at least inform our decision making. The goal of the, the alliance is to develop evaluation tools, methods, and standards and to tackle large-scale projects in the pre-competitive space. Pre-competitive, I mean before a device is on the market. So the evaluation methods, the analysis tools, the phantoms, and so on. We have a meeting upcoming on February 27th and 28th that uh, is in cooperation, my, my data collection, our data collection project is in cooperation with the Alliance meeting and they've been very supportive of my work and providing lots of feedback. I suggest you check out the agenda which includes some great organizations like Dell and Google to discuss how AI has been um, impacting their business and what challenges they've had and how they have overcome them. We also have a new headliner uh, um, from the former governor of Utah and the former um, secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services here in the United States. Um, and uh, I, I encourage you to check out that agenda. Um, we have already over 250 stakeholders signed up for the distribution of information from this alliance, so-called members including government and clinical societies from pathology and radiology, and then also plenty of academic and clinical subject matter experts. We're also proud to have patient advocates involved in this alliance to keep our, our, our efforts grounded on serving patients. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. We're collecting data to build collaborative relationships to investigate methods and tools, and to support the evaluation of artificial intelligence and machine learning. We hope to inform regulatory decision making and improve submissions and support and enable interoperability of these technologies. So with that, I want to hand the uh, microphone over to Roberto Salgado, our clinical expert who is going to talk about the evaluation of chills and breast cancer. Roberto, can you take over share, slide share, uh, sharing your yes, screen? I mean, so my name is Roberto Salgado, I'm a pathologist uh, working in Belgium in, um, in a community hospital doing surgical pathology like, like most of us. Um, I'm chairing a very informal working group which is baptized as the International Immune Oncology Biomarker Working Group and mostly known as the TIL Working Group. And basically what we do is we help the community to be prepared the day that TILs will enter daily practice. Um, the reason why we choose the TILs uh, are mainly twofold. One, the TILs are at the risk of getting into daily practice in many countries in some countries already implemented in daily practice, in others getting into daily practice. And this has led to a tremendous surge of groups developing machine learning tools to detect TILs. And TILs are practically relatively easy between brackets, small round blue cells. Those are the TILs and, and plasma cells. So what I'm going to show you in the next 10 minutes is a very short tutorial that we prepared uh, when we wrote the first guideline already five to six years ago. Uh, next slide, Sarah. Um, this is a freely available tutorial um, on our website, which is www.tillsinbreastcancer.org. Um, 
And we will be developing new educational tools in the next months. Uh, next slide, Sarah. So the most important thing to start, and, and, and this is a challenge for machine learning tools, is to define the boundaries of the cancer. Because the boundaries of the cancer, that's where we count the tills in. So the first, the first thing that we do when we score whatever biomarker is we define where should we score the biomarker. Uh, so we need to define the borders. Next. Once we have defined the borders where we have to score the biomarker, uh, where it steals or whatever biomarker, we need to define where we should not score the biomarker. Uh, can you go one slide back? Yes, thank you. So there are a few exceptions where we don't score the tills, which is our areas of necrosis. And in breast cancer, we also have this so-called fibrotic focus in, in a subset of breast cancer, the high triple negatives mostly, uh, which is a very densely populated area of uh, just fibrous tissue with no tills. And this should be excluded from the analysis. Um, one difference compared to the original tutorial developed six years ago is that we have defined in a, in a, in a later um, paper what is the margin. And the margin we have defined is quite a bit really as one millimeter. Um, but the pathologist ask you why is it not two millimeters? Well, the, the, the boundary is the boundary, so we need to have some type of common sense here where we define the boundary. In the immune excluded phenotype, where you can have a, a, a very band of dense lymphoid tissue, sometimes it exceeds one millimeter, but common sense applies, we just consider that as a boundary. Next slide. Um, we focus on the stromal tills for this exercise um, for the simple reason that we have found over the past years that stromal tills are the most reproducible biomarker. The intraepithelial tills are those the tills which are within the cancer cell nest touching the tumor cells. We are not saying that these are not important. We do think that these are pretty, very well important. But in terms of reproducibility, this is very difficult to analyze by pathologists using a microscope. Um, if you do some stainings, like CD3, CD8, this goes up enormously in reproducibility. Um, but for this exercise, we focus on the stromal tills because the stromal tills are also the ones that are being introduced in daily practice and are also the ones who are being used in um, newly developed phase two trials that will be activated somewhere this year. So only the stromal tills. Next. So also here you see an example. We include only the stroma. And an important element of the analysis is that the area of the stroma is considered as 100%. And the area of the cancer cells is also considered as 100%. And this makes a big difference compared to, for example, PDL1 evaluation, where everything combined, stroma and cancer cell area, is considered as 100%. So in this case, for example, you can see that the stromal area is occupied extensively by lymphocytes and plasma cells. These are considered the tills. Uh, and let's say that is around 90% of the area. You can perfectly have 90% of stromal tills and, well, not in this example, but 50% of intraepithelial tills. So this would be 140. Uh, and the reason for that is that we consider the area of the stroma as 100% and the area of the cancer cell component also as 100%. Um, this is one of the reasons why it's very difficult to compare PDL1 stays with TILS because you just look at different parameters. Next slide. Um, and then we do as we do with all of the other biomarkers that we analyze. We just fly over the cancer within the boundaries and we start to have this mental exercise to, to average what we see. Uh, in this example, you have on your left side a case with no tools, and on your right side a case with tremendous amount of tools. And we know that this do, does exist in our daily practices. Tumors can be quite heterogeneous. And when, we, when you see different areas of different 
stromal proportion, uh, you just average. And that's one of the weak points of the method. In this case, for example, you can have, say, 1% of tills on your left and 90% of tills on the other side. This makes an average of 50%. This would be probably, in terms of prognostic outcome <clears throat> and prediction, a different tumor if you have 50% on one side and 50% of tills on the other side, which would also make 50%. And this is where tools like machine learning comes in to help us define the importance of heterogeneity. Next. Here you see the same example. On your left side, no tills. On your right side, plenty of tills. And again, the area is considered as 100% of stroma, and the cancer cell area is also 100%. So mentally, you need to take scissors and cut out the cancer cells, and what remains is a stroma. That's 100%. And that's where you need to evaluate the percentage of that area occupied by lymphocytes and plasma cells. Next, please. Here you see another example. On your right side, example 11 is a very good example to illustrate the complexities which we encounter sometimes, certainly in, in so-called basal-like triple active breast cancer. You don't have a lot of stroma. Um, so you can have these very thin rims of, of perivascular fibrous tissue within a very densely cancer cell population. And also there, you just apply the same rules. So even if you don't have a lot of stroma, where you don't need practically a lot of lymphocytes, you get easily to 80, 90% of lymphocytes. But you just apply the same rules. Um, next. And then you determine which cell types you analyze and which you don't. Neutrophils are excluded. You only analyze lymphocytes and plasma cells. And here in this example, and this is one of the reasons why gene expression profiles sometimes are discordant with what we as pathologists evaluate, because the gene expression takes into account the lymphocytes which are part of the necrotic area. We only consider TILs um, lymphocytes and plasma cells in stroma within the cancer cell boundary, within the cancer boundaries, not in necrotic areas, also not in normal breast lobules, and also not in lymphoid aggregates or tertiary lymphoid structures. Next. Here you see the same example. Example 14, on the left half of example 14, this is necrosis full of neutrophils and full of debris, full of necrotic lymphocytes. This is captured by gene expression profiles. And this is one of the reasons why sometimes you see discrepancies. Next, please. And then we do what we almost always do when we evaluate biomarkers. We put it in a category. So when we analyze HER2 immunostochemistry, for example, what most of us do is we define, is it a 3 plus? No. Is it a 1 plus? No. Then it's a 2 plus. And the same applies for the TILs. So you put it in a category. Are we at the lower end? Are we in the middle? Or are we at the higher end? And then we make a decision. What I personally do is a, is a bit different than this. If I start by saying, is it more or less than 50% of the stroma? If you make that, that decision already, that's a very big step. And then you go to the extremes. Is it more or less than 80% or is it more or less than 10%? So when you have made that decision, then it becomes relatively easy to define the stroma to account. That's how most pathologists do. But you're free to evaluate the tools, how you think, what you feel most comfortable with. Next slide, please. Um, and then you assigned a stromal score of TILs. And when you encounter different zones of TIL proportion in your cancer cell, you just average. And that's one of the disadvantages. Maybe this is not biologically relevant, but this is how it has been proven to be clinically valid uh, in most phase one, two, and phase three studies. 
Um, when we say 90% of tills, this doesn't mean that every single micrometer or millimeter stroma needs to be occupied by tills, just like in a lymph node. You can have stroma in between. Lymphocytes will still have a very high count. But that's a semantic discussion. In, in practice, it will always be very high. Next. So that's it. Um, this is a very short tutorial. Uh, we will be developing uh, a video tutorial where you just sit and watch for five minutes how people explain how to do the tools. We will be developing a more extended one hour webinar uh, in the next two months where we will explain in detail uh, how we score the tools. You can always mail me. Uh, Carsten Denkert's mail has changed, I found recently. Uh, but you can, you can always mail me um, if you want to be interested in participating in what we do as a working group. Thank you. Up to you, Brandon. Thanks, Roberto. Um, we'll take some questions after uh, Sarah finishes, and feel free to kind of load up your questions in the chat box. Um, that might be a nice way to kind of order the questions. But I'm going to hand the microphone now to Sarah. If you could, uh, I guess you're already sharing your screen, you can take it away. Okay, great. So I'm going to start my talk here on um, the EDAP Studies Wiki page. Um, it's through this uh, NCI Hub page, and you can just go and search EDAP Studies, and this page will pop up. It's um, accessible by everyone, even if you don't have a NCI account. So I'm going to click here to Year 3, Data Collection Information and Materials. And I'm going to scroll down. Everything uh, on this page has uh, all the information that you'll ever need to know about uh, the HTT project and all of our plans for data collection. And I'm going to go through this document here, the study, Data Collection Tutorial HTT. And today I'm just going to use a PowerPoint for ease of use, but it'll download as a PDF. So uh, basically, uh, this tutorial is set up to provide operational data collection instructions to you all, the HTT study participants, the pathologists. Um, and we're going to provide a quick demonstration of the hardware and software that's used in the HTT project. Um, we have one microscope mode, which we call the Evaluation Environment for Digital and Analog Pathology, or EDAP, and then two digital modes. Um, they're online platforms built by our amazing collaborators uh, called CA Microscope and Path Presenter. And a prerequisite to this operational training is, of course, the clinical training on the visual till assessment, or VTA, that you've just received from Roberto. So uh, while you're collecting data, you're going to start with one of two modes. Um, either you'll be collecting data in person at the microscope, uh, seated with a study coordinator to help you. Uh, or you'll be seated at your personal computer or at one of the computers that we bring on the 28th to collect in digital mode. Um, so you'll be presented a sequence of regions of interest, and for each region of interest, you'll conduct uh, three tasks. Your first task is labeling that ROI. Uh, the second task is uh, an indication of the VTA eligibility, your visual till assessment. Um, and then your third task is actually completing the visual till assessment. That's where you're recording your percent tills, um, as Robert, Roberto just discussed. So approximately 80 ROIs per batch, uh, 10 ROIs per slides, and eight slides, as Brandon spoke with on earlier. So this is just a view of that ROI that you'll be presented with. On the left, you see the digital ROI. It's a bounding box within a, a digital image uh, shown on your monitor. And then on the right, uh, when you're seated at the microscope, what you'll see is sort of like a square bullseye. 
uh, it's a reticle that's placed within the, uh, the microscope eyepiece, and you'll be using the largest bounding box that's seen in that reticle to uh, make your evaluations on just the tissue that's seen within that box. So moving on to your first task, you're labeling the ROI, either intratumoral stroma, tumor with no intervening stroma, invasive margin, or other regions. Uh, and we like to note that uh, only the intratumoral stroma and the invasive margin are eligible for the visual tilt assessment for the clinical reasons that Roberto just discussed. So that brings us to task two, where you will mark eligibility for the visual tilt assessment. On the left are two examples of the non-eligible uh, tissue, and on the right are the two, two examples of the types of eligible tissues. Then you'll move on to task three, where you're evaluating the eligible ROIs for the percent stromal tail density and recording using the sliding bar or a numeric entry box, or when you're seated at the microscope, you'll have your uh, your study coordinator there to help you um, enter your information into your digital user interface. So we like to provide this to uh, participants as they're collecting data. We found that a lot of people have enjoyed it as sort of a cheat sheet um, to, to make sure you're um, keeping in, in line with, uh, with the, uh, the guidances coming from Roberto's group. So the slides and images for evaluation in this, uh, in this study are all, we're using needle core biopsies of ductal breast carcinomas, all stained with H&E. Each sample is coming from a, a different patient, and we are not sharing hormone status or other uh, orthogonal test outcomes with you all. Um, the HCT project uh, elected this use case for several reasons. I won't go over them now, but we can talk about them later. Um, I'm going to dive into the EDAP system, that's our microscope collection mode. So EDAP is comprised of hardware and software components. So on the screen you see the hardware components, but the software components of EDAP is what we call a, a process called registration, where you are mapping the coordinates of the tissue found on the glass slide to the coordinates of that same tissue scanned in the digital image. So mapping what I see uh, in the reticle of the eyepiece um, on the actual tissue on the glass slide to the same ROI that's seen on the right there in the monitor, the digital uh, corresponding image. So. Uh, when using EDAP, again, I'm sitting, I'm a pathologist, and I'm sitting with my study coordinator, and my coordinator is helping me um, to, uh, to record all of my responses. Uh, again, I'm going through tasks one, two, and three. I'm selecting my ROI label from my given list of options. I'm verifying that the VTA is appropriate, and then I'm recording my till density. Um, so just a note about how to uh, progress to the next slide, but I do want to mention that, of course, for, for every IRB-approved study, you, you may abort the study at any time. So we ask that pathologists always evaluate at 20x. Um, you can, when in microscope mode, uh, change the objective for context when completing task one, when you're uh, assigning a label to that ROI, we find that is helpful to some pathologists, but we ask that you not move the stage because we do not want to uh, negatively impact the registration that's done between the, uh, the tissue on the stage and the digital image. So now I'm going to move into our first digital platform which is CA Microscope. So we ask that you sign in with your Google account. I do want to make a quick mention here that um, we will not be using your email accounts or any PII in the analysis or publications. They are all going to be done anonymously via a hashing system to your emails. However, we will use your email to, uh, to contact you for follow-up. 
So once we sign in, uh, we ask that you accept the terms of the consent form, and you can do so at that bottom left corner there, um, and then you click continue. Uh, then you'll start by taking a survey. Your participant survey really just um, kind of characterizes you as a pathologist, and we're doing so by a very simple marker, just how many years you've been a pathologist, or if you're a resident, uh, what year of residency you're in. Uh, so then you'll actually start the study by clicking this pick and annotate button. Now, uh, for now, we're asking that everyone begin with batch one and then working sequentially. That may change as we uh, accumulate a lot of pathologist review on the first batch, and maybe we'll want to uh, get more reviews on batch eight later on. Uh, but this is how we're going to start. So we ask that you complete all slides in the batch. One great feature about signing in with your Google account is if you find that you're unable to complete the entire batch in one setting, I can easily log back in here and complete this batch, and you'll see that the first slick slides are complete. I have a green check, and the bottom two are incomplete. I have two more ROIs left to evaluate on the seventh slide, and I have no ROIs complete on the eighth slide of this batch. So, um, as I kind of mentioned uh, previously, some pathologists want to uh, scroll around, and zoom and pan uh, while they are completing that first task, partic particularly while they're labeling the ROI type. So you can do so uh, using your mouse or the sliding bar on the bottom right, and then you can always use this reset button uh, on the top left there to uh, reset your ROI view after scrolling and panning. So again, you'll go through your three tasks here, your ROI label, your VTA um, eligibility, and then actually doing your tilt density. Uh, so while I'm using CA Microscope, I can use this graph button and review that cheat sheet, as I like to call it. And then I can click my help button to review my training documents. So again, we're asking you to evaluate it to 20x, and in digital mode, you do have the ability to zoom in and out and scroll through surrounding tissue. So I'm going to go through Path Presenter. We have, I will note that we have had some uh, changes to Path Presenter since I created this slide deck, but um, edits will be made, and, and uh, as I showed you in the beginning of my section of this talk, um, everything is going to be updated on that year three page of the wiki, so you can find all up-to-date information there. So again, we're asking you to uh, begin with batch one and work sequentially. And again, completing all slides in the batch, just note it's a little different on where it shows you your number of ROIs. Um, this one is in the middle. So I'm going to use my next and previous buttons to begin. I'm zooming and panning a little differently. I'm using these, um, these magnification buttons at the top. But again, I'm still going through those same three tasks, my uh, ROI label, my VTA eligibility, and my tilt density. And again, we're asking you to evaluate a 20X and the ability to zoom in and out is absolutely available. Uh, I do wanna say one key thing that I'm missing here uh, from my presentation is that Path Presenter actually created a really great video that is a tutorial of their platform and that is going to be made available on their, uh, on their platform when it's open on the 28th and we actually start collecting data um, so that's going to be another great resource for you to use on that platform. And uh, that's everything I have for you. Brandon, I'm going to pass it back to you. Thanks, Sarah. Nice job. Uh, likewise, Roberto. So I think we're on schedule, which is always amazing. Um, and we're happy to take some questions. Uh, I, there is a raise your hand button. Um, might, if we start stepping on each other too much, maybe we'll go to that or maybe we'll go to the chat. But if we uh, just have a few questions, we can take that.
by opening up your mic and um, and asking. Everyone, I'm sure we'll be happy to leave early, but I'm also sure that there's got to be at least one question out there. Who's going to step forward? All right. I don't have a problem getting to 15 minutes back. And uh, we appreciate you joining us today. This, re this meeting has been recorded and we'll get it on that wiki page uh, as well as the, the videos related to the different platforms. Brandon, uh, Roberto here. Just for the, for the audience of the participants, can you detail what will happen after this exercise? So I'd be happy to. The, this is our first um, data collection event and our first batch of images. Uh, we'll start analyzing the data and working through some of our statistical methods to see if uh, we have a good plan uh, and see what the results show us. We uh, intend to use some of the research collaboration agreements and uh, and uh, tools to source slides from other sites. So we have some other sites identified within our collaboration, but I think that is always uh, uh, an effort to whoever's got the slides most ready to step forward. And uh, we have informed consent documents that can be templated or copied. And um, as we move to collect data from two more or three more sites so that we have a robust distribution of slides from multiple sites. Uh, as we are evaluating the uh, reader agreement, we then will then consider an algorithm and how the analysis of the performance of that algorithm could be evaluated. I expect that these analyses will take several months. Um, and related to the medical device development tool that was highlighted in my talk as a mechanism for uh, where this data could result, um, we will be pursuing that qualification with the agency and interacting hopefully with the agency on um, shaping the data, characterizing the data, and making it available to any algorithm developer that wants to evaluate their algorithm. So that's kind of the long arc of this effort. We, uh, in, in the very near future, are planning to write a paper kind of outlining the kind of concept of this project and our first efforts, um, probably a paper or two on the statistical methods that we're designing. Uh, and engaging other statisticians to be a part of that effort. Uh, definitely looking for expertise in that area to uh, expand our uh, perspectives and toolbox. And then ultimately a manuscript on reader agreement, um, probably from the data we collect imminently, and then uh, another paper is planned as we get multi-site data. Um, I think I hit on many of the objectives and plans in the next six months. I, I anticipate that if the medical device development tool effort continues, that that will take um, iterations with the agency and will take a little longer. And we'd like to share all those communications with the community so they can understand what it's like to communicate with the agency and get a medical device development tool uh, qualified as that culture um, really is uh, uh, something that a lot of individuals would like to see as it is quite mimicking a medical device um, application. So I just want to make sure that that's 
clear that this data will be for a medical device development tool, which in some ways is analogous to a medical device, but in other ways is very different from a medical device. A medical device is intended to be used to support patients, whereas a tool is intended to support the actual device evaluation. Um, Sarah, feel free to add anything that I may have forgotten. And I see we have some collaborators on the phone as well. Happy to hear others. This is uh, Matt Levitt from Lumea. I just uh, first wanted to thank uh, each of you for the, your pioneering efforts. Um, I think this is, uh, we're, we're all recognizing the need to uh, better define the pathway to uh, implement these tools. And I just applaud your efforts and look forward to participating uh, with you in uh, Los Angeles. Great, thank you for your support. All right. I think I've left the dead silence go long enough. Um, as you saw, we dropped our emails here and there throughout. You know where the wiki page, it's the NCI Hub, should be easy to find on the web. And then within the NCI Hub, our group, our project is called EDAP Studies. And uh, hopefully you have no trouble finding that. My name is Brandon Gallus. My email is pretty easy as well, brandon.gallus at fda.hhs.gov. And uh, I wish you all a great rest of the week and hope to see you in Los Angeles.